Welcome to Locked On Horn Frogs. I'm Stephen Simcox, your host. At SMU, Sonny Dykes got an unfortunate nickname of September Sonny because his teams tended to fade down the stretch. I'll tell you why I'm not worried about that with this TCU group. We'll assess that next uh, and more on Locked On Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome back into Locked On Horn Frogs. I am Stephen Simcox, your host. So the last few seasons at SMU, uh, which is where Sonny Dykes was, of course, before he came over to TCU and took over as head coach. Horn Frogs are six and zero. They're rolling K State this week, Saturday night game. Should be a fantastic atmosphere. And obviously, TCU is off to a great start. Now, during Sonny Dyke's tenure at SMU, um, he kind of earned this moniker. And I don't like, I don't know what the timing of this was. It feels like SMU fans started calling him this after he decided to leave, but he got the nickname September Sunny. And this is something that my pal Matt Jennings has sort of brought up to me in the past few weeks, like, hey, this is something we just need to watch. Like, his teams have tended to fade down the stretch. And listen, it's a fair criticism, um, but I'm not real worried about it for this TCU team. And I was looking at the last couple seasons at SMU, and I'll I'll tell you why I'm not worried about it. First of all, I think it's sort of overblown. Because in 2021, they started out 7-0, and and then they went 1-4 and down the stretch. But I feel like we almost have to completely take out the 2021 season because, you know, when when TCU let Gary Patterson go, or those two parties parted ways, Sonny Dykes immediately was a top candidate for the TCU job. And, I mean, it was, it was sort of an open secret. Like, besides maybe a brief – there was a rumored brief flirtation with Billy Napier – there was the Deion Sanders situation where TCU interviewed him, um, which at the time, like this is neither here nor there, but at the time that sounded sort of wild. But now, like you see what Deion's doing at Jackson State, he's done an incredible job there. But anyway, they were they were talking with him as well. But the one consistent name was Sonny Dykes, and I mean, two weeks before the season, everybody sort of knew. Two weeks before the season was over last year, everybody sort of knew. Sonny Dykes was the guy. Before SMU's last game, they had basically already hired Rhett Lashley, the Miami offense coordinator, to be their new head coach. So it was it was out there. And the team kind of fell apart. And I think in large part, it was because of all the rumors and, you know, all the news that was out there about Sonny leaving for the TCU job. Now, did he handle that as well as he could have? I don't really know. It's hard to say. Breakups are messy. It's just how it is. Like, these things rarely end well. Um, and Sonny has come out in recent weeks and said, hey, you know, I think SMU people were uh, were leaking this information um, to the media to make me look bad. So 2021, honestly, like, I think you almost have to throw that out because the team, um, there was a lot of distractions there, and I don't think Sonny and his staff were fully, you know, focused, like, not in a terrible way, but I just don't know how you could be. I think the players were not fully focused. And so I think that's out the window. Um, Let's go over to 2019 now. The team finished 10 and three. They started six and oh, so they went four and three down the stretch. They had losses to uh, Memphis in November, a loss to Navy, a loss to FAU in the, in their bowl game. But overall, I mean, like the end of the season wasn't fantastic, but for the most part, they hung in there. You know, they had a, a win over Houston in late October. They had a win, a, a big time win over ECU in November. So finishing your season four and three, when you start six and oh, that's disappointing. I understand, but I wouldn't say it was just total collapse. And then in 2020, um, which was the COVID year. They went seven and three, and they lost their t- last two games of the season before the bowl game. They were seven and one. They lost to Tulsa and lost to ECU. Lost a close game to Tulsa, and then got blown out by ECU 
to end the season. So one, I'll just say that SMU enjoyed more success than they ever had. And did they close the season poorly? Yeah, I think you could say that's the case. One of those seasons, I feel like there were some outside distractions that really hurt them. In the other two years, um, definitely could have finished stronger. But, I mean, I, I don't think going four and three down the stretch is just like an epic an epic collapse that really turned, you know, the whole fabric of the season. And also, like, part of it is they faced some better teams in the American Conference. You know, they played Memphis. They played ECU. They had to play Cincinnati late in the year. And those are really good football teams. Those are programs that were probably at a higher place and a little more ahead than SMU was at the time. The schedule here for TCU is difficult. Um, play K-State at home, on the road at West Virginia, and then you play Texas Tech at home. Now, if they find a way to win this week and get to 7-0, and I know they can't think about this, but I can because I'm not playing. If they can get to 7-0, and if they can beat K-State, which would be really difficult because K-State's a good football team, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But if they get 7-0, and I think there's a path to them being 9-0 and when they roll into Austin, Texas, for what is probably going to be a pretty huge game in the Big 12 standings. My goal at this point, I think a, a realistic goal at this point, now that you're 6-0 and and you're playing well, you've beaten some good teams, I feel like TCU should make the Big 12 title game. I think that should be the expectation. That should be the goal. And if they don't, it's not like, oh, no, it's the worst thing in the world. It's still year one. I think they're ahead of schedule. But if you do, I just feel like it'd be huge for the program, be huge for the momentum, for recruiting, just to see what can happen in one season. Now, yes, first they have to beat Kansas State. And then they have to go on the road to Morgantown. And then, you know, you're back home against Texas Tech. But I think that's a possibility that you could be 9-0 and rolling into that game against Texas. The other reason I'm not really worried about a late season collapse for this team, I think they have already shown some mental toughness and some fortitude. And I just don't see them... Like, I think, I think guys are bought in. I don't see them just laying down. Like, not that they won't. Like, yeah, there's they're going to probably lose a couple games this season. I don't see them going 12-0. and 0. But you know what? They've improved a ton. I think they're tough. I think they're physical. And I believe in this group. Like, the way they came back from down 24-7 last week against Oklahoma State and won in double overtime, that showed a lot of guts. The way they came back when they were down to Kansas a few weeks ago and found a way to win that football game on the road against the red-hot KU team that was flying high and just had college game day in their backyard, I think that showed a lot of mental toughness. Kaz Kazadi has done a fantastic job getting these guys physically, you know, in a place where they can really lean on teams for four quarters. The other factor is the schedule is tough itself, but – they had that early bye week. So, you know, they're in the middle of a stretch where they're playing 10 straight games. That's a long, long stretch. That's a lot of football in a row. And you make the Big 12 title game, you're talking about 11 weeks in a row where you're playing a game. And, you know, the injuries are piling up a little bit. We'll talk about that next. But I've just been super impressed with the job this team has done so far. When we come back, um, an unfortunate injury update for a linebacker the CCU program. We'll talk about the next on Lockdown Horn Frogs. Okay, so Marcel Brooks, um, who has become a, a great leader for this TCU team. I've been really impressed with how he's played this year. And most of you probably know Marcel's journey, but if you don't, he was at LSU, five-star recruit, was playing defense, was playing kind of a hybrid position. He was like a safety, but he was also playing on the edge and rushing the passer. And so he transferred to TCU after LSU's national championship season and came in and played uh, in 2020 and didn't get a whole lot of snaps. Um, He was on defense at the time. Then 2021 last season, they moved him to wide receiver. And that didn't work out. That experiment didn't work out. And so the new staff moved him back to linebacker. He got hurt during fall camp, missed the first few games of the year, but showed a lot of leadership 
and was just like in the middle of everything, rooting his teammates on, trying to help, trying to do everything he could, help the team win. Got back, uh, made a huge tackle in that Kansas game. You know, had some snaps um, the week before against Oklahoma. And it was like, all right, he's finally healthy. He's finally here. He's going to get more run in this defense. And then got cut in the Oklahoma State game um, by an offensive lineman. And unfortunately, according to Sonny Dykes on Tuesday, he had season-ending surgery. So Marcel's missing the rest of the year. Sings for him. He's just he's bought in like everybody else. And I'm super sad that he couldn't find a way to, to stay on the field this year. Obviously not his fault. Um, I hope that he can stay around the team. You know, I know it's it's tricky when you have surgery, going on road trips and that kind of thing, but I hope he can stay around the team as much as possible because he just seems like one of the guys that fires them up, that gets them excited, that understands, you know, what he's supposed to do. And as far as linebacker goes, they're hurting, man. And it's going to be a big week for the linebacker position because – Kansas State runs. They run downhill on you. Deuce Vaughn, Adrian Martinez, they want to get after it on the run game. And so, I mean, your starters for the most part are still there. You know, Z Winters is still there. Uh, Jamoy Hodge, um, Johnny Hodges. But you're you're real thin in the back end. You've now lost um, Thomas Armstrong for the season. You've lost Terrence Cooks for the season. He was gone before the year due to a surgery. And now you've, you've lost Marcel Brooks. So, Chad Banks, um, I think he's going to have to step up and, and get some more snaps, and that's a guy that Horn Frog fans have been excited about for a long time. You know, Wyatt Harris but might be another guy who has to step in and um, pick up some of the slack, but that's going to be one of those positions that you just have to watch. Um, there's one or two of those every year where you're, you're super thin, and coming into the season there were already some depth concerns, and now it's only been magnified by all these injuries. So, I mean, first things first, I hope Marcel Brooks – he just gets better and fully recovers. I'm not sure what the details are going to be on um, his, you know, red shirt situation. I think I would hope he would try to come back for another season. He seems really bought in with his coaching staff. But, again, I know that's one of a decision the player has to make. And then, two, it's just about numbers and roster management and those kind of things. But I hope to see him um, next year as well. And, and best of luck with his recovery. Final thing before we go here on TCU Athletics, I want to mention a basketball note. I talked about TCU basketball. The man, there's a lot of hype. Mike Miles picked its preseason player of the year in the Big 12. Um, they're picked to finish fourth in the conference. And the Horn Frogs come in the AP Top 25 poll at number 14. So I'll quickly run down the teams ahead of them. North Carolina's at one, Gonzaga at two, Houston at three, Kentucky at four, Kansas at five, uh, Baylor at five. They're tied there. Same number of votes. Duke at seven. UCLA at eight. Creighton at nine. Arkansas at 10. Tennessee at 11. Texas at 12. Indiana at 13. And the TCU Horn Frogs sitting there at number 14 in the country. They had a scrimmage against Alabama, which apparently they won handily. And Nate Oates and that Alabama squad, that Alabama program, they've been really good the last few years. So exciting times. We're still watching that Damian Ball situation. Hopefully the NCAA um, reinstates him, or if it's a suspension, it's a short suspension, and they can move on and allow him to play because he's going to be a big factor for this team this year. But I'm excited about TCU basketball, and everybody's in full football mode. I am too. We're going to have more tomorrow about uh, this Kansas State team and what they, what kind of challenges they present for TCU. This is Lockdown Horn Frogs. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day.